We are so delighted to have you here at the opening evening of the Global Energies Cultures Forum, the fifth installment in Georgetown University and Qatar's Hiwarat series. Since its inception in September, Hiwarat's mission has been to unite scholars, practitioners, and the public in exploring timely questions. Our Dean, Dr. Safwan Masri's leadership has been pivotal in this process, inspiring innovative, multidisciplinary, and collaborative efforts. This forum in particular, and I think I speak for many of us, has pushed us way beyond our traditional academic comfort zone, reflecting our long-term commitment to engaging now in truly transformative collaborations. Throughout the day, you've already witnessed the forum's exploration of pivotal questions surrounding energy and its impact on human life, approached from both academic and artistic perspectives. The choice of the Mohammed bin Jassim House as our venue tonight adds a profound cultural and historical backdrop to our discussions. And we are very grateful to our colleagues at, Mish at Mishariv Museums not only for their partnership, but for also providing us with this magnificent space. Again, I thank you all for joining us this evening, and without further delay, I invite the Dean of Georgetown University in Qatar, Dr. Safwan Masri, who will lead us into a fascinating conversation with the distinguished Victor Ekmenor. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Zahra. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you for joining us throughout the day, and thank you in advance for joining us tomorrow. I'm delighted to welcome you to the opening evening of the Global Energy Cultures Forum, the fifth installment, as Zahra has mentioned, in Georgetown University's Qatar's Hiwarat series. This is an extraordinary setting, and we are deeply grateful for the opportunity to partner with Mshereb Museums and to center this forum in such a culturally and historically significant place. Since its launch in September, the mission of Hiwarat has been to bring together scholars, practitioners, artists, and the public in an exploration of pivotal, pertinent, and timely questions. This particular iteration of Hiwarat, which concludes the series for this fall term, is also an extension of the three-year-long Energy Humanities Research Initiative con convened by Georgetown Center for International and Regional Studies and a number of our distinguished faculty. This initiative aims to turn GUQ, Georgetown University in Qatar, and Doha into a hub for global energy studies with a particular focus on historical and humanistic approaches that reorient the field away from its historical emphasis on the North Atlantic. Taking a global perspective, the conversations we had today and will continue tomorrow highlight various forms of knowledge and practice enabled by and resulting from the culture of energy production and consumption. While we have always emphasized the importance of academic conversations, this forum takes a unique approach by not only stimulating thought, provoke, thought through scholarly discussions, but also integrating thought-provoking art exhibits and conversations with talented artists. Artists can enrich the creative dimensions of fora such as this one. And this particular forum has hugely benefited from the brilliant engagement of our first artist in residence at Georgetown University in Qatar, Victor Ehi Khamenor. Victor has been on the GUQ campus over the past two weeks working on an original work entitled For Those Who Slept in the Dark with Identifiable Ghosts, which he created specifically for the forum. The artwork is on public display in the main foyer of the company house and will be exhibited until January 27. If you have not had a chance to view it yet, 
I very strongly encourage you to do so. Now, Georgetown University appointing an artist in residence is, some might say, highly unusual. I would instead say it is exceptional. It is an innovative experiment driven by our commitment to foster meaningful connections between art and the humanities in the curriculum, in research, and in practice, and to create opportunities for our community to engage with art on a daily basis. Victor produced this work at his temporary painting studio at Georgetown University in Qatar. Members of the GUQ community had the opportunity to visit Victor during his open studio hours to engage with him and observe his practice in real time. Our engagement with Victor is long-standing. He has been part of the Energy Humanities Research Initiative housed at the Center for International and Regional Studies. Before I introduce Victor, I do want to acknowledge and thank the faculty who have worked tirelessly on putting this forum together and on the work that they have done in the energy, cultures, and humanities uh, work that has been convened by CIRS over the years. Professor Firat Orich, Professor Vicky Gugasian, and Professor, Professor Trish Kajle, as well as from Northwestern University in Qatar, Anto Mohsen. So please join me in a round of applause to those faculty. Now I'd like to introduce Victor. Victor is a Nigerian-American, multidisciplinary visual artist and writer, known for his vibrant and incisive works that engage with African cultural heritage, its resonance within the global African diaspora, and the post-colonial politics of his native Nigeria. His work uses materials and iconography that embrace the traditions and histories of Africa while integrating elements that allude to the continent's colonial past and Nigeria's complex geopolitical position as an oil production, as an oil producing nation. The scenes and figures depicted often mix symbols that straddle his Benin Kingdom traditions and Catholic upbringing. This duality builds narratives that comment on the complex cultural and political reality of Nigerians in their private and public lives, both historically and at present. Victor's work has been exhibited worldwide, including at the first Nigerian pavilion at the 57th Venice Biennale in 2017. Recently, his piece, Still Standing, was installed in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, an affirmation of the sacred in Edo culture, as well as a challenge to histories of colonial plunder and plunderers elsewhere memorialized in the cathedral. Victor has been included in solo and group exhibitions at museums, galleries, and biennials around the world. Victor, thank you for accepting our invitation and for being part of the GUQ community for the past couple of weeks. We have captured Victor's journey with us in a short video. Let's watch Victor's engagement with the community and his artistic progress in crafting the inspiring artwork for those who slept in the dark with identifiable ghosts. To enter a big piece like this, which is about 14 feet by 10 feet, you have to find the story. I didn't paint it, you understand, it's the actions of the world that have made it paint. I really wanted to explore some materials in the region. We went to a local market to acquire these ones. Some of them have already been used by people that used it for 10, but it's, they no longer use it. So, which means it has a lot of uh, amazing energy in them. 
Charcoal is one of my favorite medium to work with. It's one of my very first material I could use while I was growing up in the village because you can just grab the charcoal from a fireside and go at your mother's wall and just start scribbling on them until she come and give you a little bit of whacking. <laughs> The title now is for those who slept in the dark with identifiable ghosts. Sometimes those that cause nightmare for others are those that they know, they are those that are close to them. So it's something that has to explode in whoever is looking at it and you have to look very carefully because there are things that you yourself have not seen now that are there. <laughs> The falcon here is very symbolic because it has the olive leaf for peace. The falcon is a bed of prey. But it also can, you know, how can you make falcon peaceful to the extent that it becomes a pet? You know, have very peaceful birds coming here uh, all the time. There are pigeons that, that hang on the windows, free birds and stuff like that, you know, so. But they are not the one that you need to like talk about peace to because they are already peaceful. What is the metaphor there is that, look, the people that you feel like, okay, they are more powerful, more military sophisticated and all of those, those are the guys that you have to preach peace to. Victor Ehikhamenor, please join me on the stage for a conversation. Take care of him. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, that was really riveting to watch. Um, you had fun with it, didn't you? Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> you, 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 you obviously, I mean, had fun. And I was asking Victor over dinner about uh, the visits by uh, faculty and students and staff members. Um, and I would love to hear from you about what that experience was like. Uh, I'd like to focus on three main topics, uh, if I may, Victor, with you. And first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, I want to talk about the piece uh, for those who slept in the dark with identifiable ghosts and have you uh, talk to us about the choice of that piece and the process of coming up with it the interaction you had with members of the community while you were doing it. Uh, talk to us about the title. And then maybe we can talk a little bit more broadly about the intersection with energy cultures and sort of how um, fitting this is for it and how artistic production in general um, is intertwined with issues of energy systems and aesthetics and so on. Um, and talk about your uh, you know, more broadly also your artistic trajectory. But let's start with the piece. Talk to us about the piece. What, what inspired you to do it? How was the process of uh, uh, producing it? Um, how was the interaction with members of the community? And did that help inform how it developed and evolved? Did you come in with a preconceived notion of what it was going to look like at the end? Or did it you know, did you breathe life into it and, and, and it evolved? Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate uh, I want to thank uh, Qatar as a nation. I want to thank uh, the university, Georgetown University, for inviting me. I've done quite a number of uh, residencies in my career. Not one have I been to where I was given a massage before I went to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you, and uh, thanks to the 
the staff that have been really amazing and wonderful. And I know you asked me about the about what was my experience. It was one of the most amazing um, experience I've had. I've been to Qatar before, but this was really, really amazing. The help, there was no day that I didn't get what I wanted to make this possible. And I want to thank you for your leadership as well for that. And the staff that were with me, I can't mention everybody's name, but everybody really were helpful. Um, I came with, I mean, we've been talking about this residency for the longest time with Susie, um, Mira, and the rest groups that were talking to me about it. We were going back and forth. I sent, um, you know, a proposal. And usually for an artist, a proposal for a residency or something like this is almost like a key that lets you into a room. Whatever you then do in that room is totally up to you as long as you don't veer off too much. But when I came, when we started, we were talking about, if some people look at some of the press releases, it would say, take a deep breath, was the title of the proposal, you understand? Looking at energy, looking at clean air, uh, renewable energy and stuff like that. How do you capture that? Because I've done things in the past that relate to environmental pollution. But then the world just kind of took uh, a turn that, not that we don't expect it, but just a complete turn that was really, uh, that is really still bad as we speak, you know. So I then sat down and started having a conversation with the canvas uh, for a very long time. Conversation with the canvas. Yes, for a very long time. I mean, I, I engaged with the community first, to be totally honest with you, what you saw it's a collaboration. Collaboration not in your usual way or in an orthodox way, but I went to the market, I went to the souk around here. Soukwakif. Yes, Soukwakif. Yeah. And um, I went with Fahad from Mushreb with Suzy. Well, Fahad, know. who's one of our alums, by yes, the way. Yes, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so it was really cool and took me, to, um, took me to where they make tents, like tent maker, because I wanted to use something from the something that is familiar with the people, something that can connect the work with, with this environment, with where I'm working at and all of that. So we did not really go to any former art store like you would go to in a Western country or something like that because, I mean, this is how things are made, you know. This is how community engage and create things that are useful in their community. So I needed to tap into that kind of was it a new fabric or was it a used they fabric? They were already used. Part of it were already used and they are the same. They had to cut it up and sew it back together Was again. that important? Yes, it was work? very important for me because that human touch, that community, that coming together that ties the things together. I'm not coming from where you do things solo. And I think it's the same thing here. Where you, when you want to build a house, you call the community and they help you. And you you guys work together. You so know, the so fabric has life. Yes. It, it has, has energy. It has energy. It has it. stories. It Completely. has stories that it has heard yes. and, and secrets it yes. has kept. Yes. And it has helped people. It has yeah. been a shelter for people and all of that. And I was just really adding something to it, you know, like something that's already created. I'm adding something to it, you know, so which was quite... Um, amazing for me to do and to have that opportunity to not just go into an art store, buy a piece of canvas and all of that. And, yeah. you know, so we even had a conversation with the guy at the firehouse who was like, oh, you're going to find it difficult to work with uh, tent canvas because it's made to protect uh, water. But he didn't know I wasn't going to use any water based thing. I was going to use charcoal on it. So then we had a beautiful um, work at the end of the day. So t talk to us about the process, right? I mean, so um, you, you bought it, you put yeah. it up there. Um, again, did you, you said that you had conversation with the canvas, right? Yes. I mean, yes. and this is, so how did the piece, how did the artwork evolve? How did it develop? Um, did any of the visitors, you know, the students, faculty and staff who came to see you, were you inspired by any of those conversations that caused you to maybe intrinsically or explicitly and consciously uh, do things? I would say w one thing I did was that I walked around the community a lot. I walked around, you know, so then I visited quite a few museums. I wanted to see what is happening here. Um, I, I hardly want to go into any community and be a drive-by uh, observer, you know. I wanted to, like, integrate myself. I know the time was very short. 
Uh, Susie was on my case, like, are you going to make anything? <laughs> you know, so she was so, really... So, so, okay. She was so, when I'm, so when I'm on your case, <laughs> and be on other people's cases. So she was, I was, you know, so she was a bit uh, on the nervous side. I was like, it has a process because you can't just dive into it. You know, I visited a quite a few museums um, to kind of integrate myself into the place. Plus, there is a lot of, I mean, we are, you know, no pun intended, but there's a lot of energy that goes on in a place of learning, you understand, you know. So there are students, there are, there are young ones that are hungry for knowledge, giving back knowledge as well. I went to some of the classes to teach, um, to give talks, and they ask questions and all of that. They are not related to art, but I think the whole point is to see what are the connectivity between academia and art, and at the end of the day, you realize that it's a very short distance to drive if you are intentional about doing it. Yeah, so as you know, because of conversations yeah. you've had with others and the brief conversation we had at dinner, um, we're very focused on building an art, culture, and heritage program at Georgetown. Uh, we already have a number of courses that are focused on the art. Uh, Professor Onich teaches a course on theorizing art in Qatar, for example. Uh, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Ruqayya Abu Sharaf, for example, who teaches a course that takes the students here to Mushere museums and to the slavery museum in, 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 in particular, uh, because you cannot separate art from diplomacy, which yeah. is the work that we do, right? And at dinner, um, Muhammad was telling us about the, uh, the Palestinian artist, what's his name? Katagani, Katagani yeah. who... Uh, you know his work, so maybe I mean, if you don't do. mind, I'll put you on the spot and ask you to explain it because one of the things that makes it really particular is the fact that he uses material from Gaza to depict scenes in Gaza, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I've not followed his works recently. I was just having a conversation with him and he was telling me his processes and everything. I think I've seen one of his works in the past on how he go to refugee camps and actually like take materials from there and give them a different agency, you understand? And I mean, I think every artist does that in that sense that uh, as artists, we are kind of like the mirror of the society, you understand, you know? So, and there's no way the mirror will not reflect back on what is seen, you know? So when you, when you look at you asking me what in, then began to influence the initial work that I was doing, because I mean, like, you can't just completely not be able to like speak for what is happening right now and try to use work to speak to that and say, you know, there's room for peace, which is what I, a lot of the part of that work is showing and the interconnectivity of us as a human, because there's a saying in my place that there's no way you are gonna be hurting the eyes and the nose will not bleed because there's, it's interconnected, you understand? Right. You know? So, um, of course, artists will respond, I mean, like, we sue for peace, definitely. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. I mean, you can't but think of Picasso and exactly. Guernica, exactly. right, when yeah. you talk about that. Um, so back to, you know, the intersection between arts and the humanities and you being there and interacting with uh, our students who are studying international affairs and, exactly. and uh, foreign service and diplomacy and our faculty who dedicate their lives to educating those students. Uh, these things have tremendous significance. Uh, again, we were talking about how uh, the meeting between uh, the Prime Minister of England and the Prime Minister of Greece a couple of weeks ago was cancelled when uh, uh, Prime Minister Sunak found out that on Mitsotakis's agenda was the Algen marbles, right, and the return of the, of the marbles to Greece. Um, By the way, they will call it Parthenon Mambos, not the Egan Mango, because they don't belong to Egan. So they that is not. the politics right. of okay. that. Yeah. So, so in, in Athens, yeah, you, will, the, you call it Parthenon Mambos, but in Europe or in, in British Museum, you understand, like the way they have our Bini bronzes, they will want it. It's com right? completely different. Name. Completely different. Because yeah. history is always written by exactly, the victor. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yeah. No pun intended by saying <laughs> by the victor. I just realized that. <laughs> but maybe history is written by you. Exactly. Uh, victor, can you, I don't know if you sort of indirectly, and I missed it, um, 
answered the question about the choice of the title because that is a very yeah. expressive yes. and um, you know potent title. I mean, as a writer as well, I mean, you were asking what are some of the preparations that I do before I go into a painting is that sometimes I, I read poetry, sometimes I, I read short stories and stuff like that to, to gain a trance into some of these things. And titling of works is very important because it's also what leads other people into it. Um, to kind of unbundle that title is, 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 again, speaking to what is happening in the world right now, which says to those who slept in the dark, you know, uh, with identifiable ghosts, you know, um, if we are going to kind of relate it back to energy, if you are sleeping in the dark, is it because you don't have electricity? Is it because your home has been bombed? Is it because you are unable to afford electricity or afford light? You know, so again, it's not a painting that, or the work that I've made is not work that is just for today. I hope it speaks to multiple things and multiplicity of things. But the major urgent thing about it that I wanted to come across is that we have to be able to like find room for peace, you know, and also applaud those that are making the effort to bring peace to all the conflict zones in the world. Uh, like I always said, a table that can contain a rifle can also contain a piece of paper for us to say, enough is enough, let's have peace, you understand? Where does it stop? When does it end, you know? So uh, we have to make efforts as humans to break the cycle, otherwise it keep repeating itself. So when you look at the lines that are in the paintings and all of that, it's also to show that we're interconnected. I'm using the Facon, of course. Facon is very like, it's one of the things that is predominant in this country or in this region as well. But how are we able to make Facon to become a pair that people can actually work with Facon? They are bird of praise, right? Naturally, they are made to hunt and they are made to kill and stuff. But then you are able to like have a, 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 a way of making them to be peaceful that to the extent that man can hold them. So if we're able to do that to something that is naturally born to be a predator, then what is wrong with us as humans? And so taking, yeah, um, flipping it on its head and yes. maybe thinking about the, the tool of war can also exactly. be the tool of peace. Exactly. Was the choice of Falcon inspired by your visit to Souk Waqif, uh, which also has a Falcon <laughs> market in it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you can't come here and not, and not have Falcons and all of those things. I think it was the first thing that I actually drew on that canvas. So yeah. everything that's revolved around right. it and all of that, you know, so yeah. So as somebody who is from this region, yes. um, I never thought of Falcon as a predator. I knew, always knew that a Falcon is a predator, but that's not the first thing that comes Back to my mind. mind. And I, exactly wonder how um, colleagues and friends here feel about it. But what comes to me sort of from the picture of the Falcon is immediately strength and pride, exactly. right? And reliability, dependence, yes. you know, exactly. there's something that's very majestic um, about it. Uh, now, in watching the video and also from the um, uh, look I had at the beautiful work, the Falcon is one of the few places on the canvas where you use color. Yes. Right? Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Again, is um, when I'd, I'd finished painting it, and I, the poem of W.B. Yeats comes to mind, Second Coming. I don't know how many people know about the poem. It's turning and turning the wedding guy, the Falcon cannot hear the Falconer. Um, what makes, if you read that poem, actually anybody that wants to like look at that painting should re visit that. I don't know how many people are interested in literature and poetry in the audience. You know, so in, in, in kind of, it's a, it's a, you know how you bring a theory into certain things, you understand, you know. So I think it's one of the poems that you should actually use in reading the painting, you know. So again, it, sh it shows like you are talking about the strength of it and about the, about the, about its, um, predatory nature and all of that, it's actually like, yes, it brings the redness to it, it brings the color of blood, color of danger to it, so. That's what uh, yeah. it is, okay. Yeah, yeah. The color of danger that you yes. put in the eyes of the, the, eyes falcon. Of the falcon. yes. Um, so your work echoes a lot of sort of your reading of Nigeria's colonial history, Africa's colonial history and yeah. post-colonialism. And what we've been witnessing over the past couple of months is actually 
a um, continuation of modern day colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, how does your work interact sort of with, you know, post-colonialism? Uh, how does it interact with energy and uh, in, in, in that context of colonialism and post-colonialism? Because so much of the history of this region yeah. of colonialism is intertwined with energy and, yeah. and oil in particular. Yeah. I mean, I'm, again, like you rightly said, I'm a post-colonial child and everything I read about colon colonialism and, the, and what happened in the region or in my country is, are things that I read, but you have to realize that colonialism is like poisoning a well. You never really able to clean that well. There's mm. nothing that helps clean that well. And you just have to manage and figure out a way to drink from that well. You know, so we are kind of like having the after effect of colonialism in that sense. Um, you know, because I mean, my country is an oil producing country and again, Qatar is oil producing. They have been, you know, I would say they have used their money better than I would say we have. Um, in that sense, you know, so I'm always engaging with what did oil do for us. My first, uh, my first installation that spoke to that and environmental pollution in my, my, my country, the Niger Delta, was actually my, I had the conversation with Trish, Professor Trish, in 2021, which has actually, this, this sitting on this place now is almost like a two years project in that sense where we talked about energy and all of that, you know. So, Wealth of Nation, I was re referring to Adam uh, Smith's uh, theory on Wealth of Nations, you yes. know, so, but I singularize it in the sense that I didn't put nations, I just say Wealth of Nation, which means I kind of like personalize it to what have we benefited in that sense, you know, capitalism from oil and all of that, what did it benefit us? And that installation spoke to how uh, certain commodities can be very disastrous to environment instead of being helpful uh, and tying it back to uh, Smith's uh, theory. So if you look at that as a trajectory, yes. right, and I'm going to look at the trajectory within the, um, the context of Georgetown University in Qatar yeah. and the Energy Humanities Research Initiative and you've been involved in it for a number of years, and you did a podcast actually in which you talked about uh, yeah. the wealth of nations and provided sort of a new light on how to look at Adam Smith's uh, work, as you just said. Uh, how does this piece fit within that trajectory, and how does this overall trajectory then fit in with what Victor is thinking about for the future? Um, how does this, how do you build on all of this? How does this intersect with other works that you are planning or you are executing? Sometimes, I mean, if, if I, there, 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 are bit, there are differences in the works and the thematic preoccupation of every work that I do in that sense, you know, so because there can be a correlation to other things based on this particular work. But you also have to realize that it's something that, it's a newborn, really. I mean, the painting is finished and all of that. Again, it, it takes time for even I that have created the work to then begin to con completely engaging with it because I did it in a state of faith, in a state of uh, subconsciousness in that way, you understand, you know? so. Uh, in that sense, we are looking at, we can look at the materiality, we look at charcoal, you know, so, you know, so how, where does it come from, uh, how safe is it, how does it relate to energy and stuff like that. Then we can then begin to look at the materiality of it, what is tent made from and all of that. So in that sense, you begin to deconstruct and sometimes I leave that to the critic, otherwise, if I create a work and I have to look at it critically as well, there will be job for some people. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has a life of its own now, doesn't yes, it? it does. I mean, it's like yeah. a book, yes. right? Yes. It's your baby, and you own it, and yeah. you. Um, but once it gets published, once it's it gets out, out there, yes. you don't own it, Not right? Anymore. Not it anymore. It has a life of its own, yes. and uh, you know, one thing I find in artwork, I rarely want an artist to explain to me their art, except in this kind of a conversation, exactly. right? Because it will speak to me differently than it might speak to you. Yeah. 
Um, Victor, let me... So I'm, I'm, I've become curious as I'm listening to you, and this was not part of the script, so... And I've, uh, <laughs> you know, thrown a couple <laughs> of questions uh, to you that way. Tell us, tell me about, tell us about Victor, the child growing up in Nigeria. And what was it in your life experience that you think, um, when you think back, you sort of understand a trajectory, understand the influences that you've had in your life uh, that may help explain um, who you are today vis-a-vis um, the work that you do and, and the life that you, that you lead. Uh, I'm not going to ask you the typical question of, did you always know you're going to be an artist? I don't think any of us ever knew what we were going to be in life. Yeah. I hope <laughs> that's the case. Uh, but as you look back, you know, what was your lived experience growing up in Nigeria that might help um, shed light on the path that your life has taken? I would say, thank you for the question, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, but I did know that I wanted to always be an artist at the age of nine, as soon as I knew <laughs> what the word artist meant, because at four, I had already started drawing incessantly without stopping, and um, by the time I got into primary school, I didn't pay attention to many things, you know, so uh, I already knew, and my uncle, who is 93 this year, is one of the foremost photographers in Nigeria. He studied at the Institute of, uh, Institute of Photography in New York in the 60s. So as a kid, I had already started seeing images from around the world being poured into my grandfather's compound. And also, my grandfather was a, a community chief. He was happened to, the oldest person gets to rule the village. So he happened to rule the village when I was quite young. And I, I observed a lot of things whereby the community come to settle things. And I actually watched as my father and my grandfather always made sure that no matter how tense two people are, no matter how upset they are, they were able to like calm them down before they leave the scene, before they were never allowed to go away from our compound, still angry and still fighting. And I think that has always uh, fitted into my life to always seek peace wherever I go. Uh, I'm a pacifist by, I don't know if it's by nature, but I, again, then I've, uh, coming back to art as well, you know, so I, I, I've always wanted to be an artist. I never want to be anything else. I didn't go to school to study art, which is funny, but I studied every other thing but art. I've never entered an art class before. So, um, other things fit into it, business fits into it, my English and literature background fits into it, my tech background fits into it, um, fiction writing fits into it. So again, sometimes what people are seeing is a multiplicity of different things being expressed in the canvas or in an installation or in a piece of paper. You're multidisciplinary in, in, in that respect. You have a master's in uh Creative writing and MFA from from uh, University of Maryland, don't yeah. you? Yes. Right. Yes, so your work really is at the intersection of Works literary so. art and 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 um, paintings and painting and, visual and, art, yeah. and political. Would you say political activism, or is that uh, political activism through through art, or is, uh, is that a bit of a stretch? I try not political to wear, expression. Maybe. I try not to wear that toga because if you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if, if, you, if you tell somebody not to step on your shoe, are you being political or you are being telling that person that this is just right. a boundary, you understand? You know? So yeah. oftentimes I know that there's a lot of, maybe people think it's more yeah. prestigious to say you're a political artist. No, every work is political. Even if you put a piece of paper, if we decide to clean this wall right it's now. It's all political, It's all isn't political, it? you understand? Yeah. You know? So yeah. there's no need belaboring the whole thing that, oh, yeah. I'm a political artist or a yeah. political activist or something like that. Yeah. But I speak to... Uh, certain things that I'm not comfortable with, that is obvious, that is practically like, it's, it's like mm. they are liked, you know. So, for instance, uh, my restitution conversation, I mean, I've spoken about it, you know, Britain attacked Benin Kingdom, my kingdom, in 1897, and took all the Benin bronzes that you are seeing. So, growing up and then begin to see them in foreign museums and stuff, and the owners of these things are now able to draw a line between classic African art and contemporary African art, 
then it's problematic. Because if you go to a British museum or you go to other museums, you see a lot of colonially looted objects. But then where is the modern art? Where is the uh, uh, contemporary art? Is, did we stop creating works? No, we never stopped. So the question is then, what happened? Is it more prestigious because you, it's blood tainted, because you conquered it and all of that? You know, so things like that, when you speak up on that and say, where these things were taken in the first place, they were not supposed to be art. They are archives. They are ways that we documented our ways of life, coronations and things that we believe in, belief history. system, yeah. history and all of that. You know, so it's like somebody coming to raid your library. Yeah, yeah. You understand, you know, so then you, disseminate this thing across the world and you begin to see pieces and bits of yourself everywhere around the world, you're going to speak up. You're going to say, this is my grandmother's work. That's my grandfather's work. You know, so does that make me poetical because I'm asking for what belongs to my people? I don't think so. I'm just being it's myself. Life, yeah, it's life. Right? It, yeah. And you're expressing it. And I think everything is political, right? Exactly. And so there is expression, perhaps, not necessarily activism. Um, you know, when Zahra spoke and introduced this uh, segment of the program, she talked about that with this program and with having you as an artist in residence and the forum that we're holding here um, has pushed us or pushed the boundaries, I think you said, Zahra. Um, we're pushing the boundaries. We're constantly pushing the boundaries. I think, I thought you were going to say, got us out of our comfort zone. We don't have a comfort zone. Right? We never want to have a comfort zone. We yeah. want to be um, you know, moving all the time and thinking all the time. So all of that is prelude to ask you, will you come back? Will you accept to be an artist in residence with us in perpetuity? As long as you have a masseuse on campus. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I've, I, um, you know, jokes apart, it's, it's been amazing. And again, I like to contribute to, yeah. um, you know, to this program. Again, like I said, this is not my first time of being in Qatar. And with the amount of cultural things going on, museums being built, new friends, meeting new friends and all of that, um, of course, definitely. And, you know, Susie, I've become good friends. I've met some family, other family, extended family members. Yes, if I'm invited, I go where I'm welcomed, you know, so I'll well, definitely be part of the Georgetown. Well, I am a DC person, so I have Georgetown. I once yeah. followed Hoyas until I went to University of Maryland, I became a Terps, you know, so, but. That's okay, we, <laughs> we forgive you going to the University of Maryland, but uh, consider so, yourself invited. Consider, thank you very consider much. Consider this an open invitation and consider yourself I think you already do, a member of the GUQ and the Georgetown University community. Uh, this is magical. I, almost, I don't want to get off the stage because I'm having such a great time having this conversation with Victor in this really magical setting. I mean, thank you, Abdullah. Thank you, thank you so uh, Fahad. Thank you, everybody who's involved uh, with the Mushera Museums for uh, hosting us. We feel at home over here. and. Victor, I can't thank you enough thank because you, so you have contributed, you are contributing, and I think you're helping us um, think and you're helping us also push the boundaries. And I really look forward um, to many, many great opportunities for us to work with you. And I'm grateful to, as I always am, uh, to my faculty who just um, work in such incredibly creative ways. Will you please join me in thanking Victor?